Our final presenter is Paul Lehman, the General Manager of the Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority. Paul graduated in 1981 from the University of Waterloo with a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering. He then started his career as a project engineer with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. He joined the, um, in 1983, he joined the Mississippi Valley Conservation Authority as a water resources engineer, advancing to general manager of the authority in 1989. He is a member of a number of advisory committees and task forces relating to the safety of Ontario's dams, Ontario's source water protection, and national remote sensing. Paul. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, good evening, and I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank the Roundtable for inviting me to uh, speak to you this evening about a topic that I think is very timely, uh, and one that will continue to present serious challenges both to our, our natural systems and our built infrastructure over the next uh, coming decades. Regardless of how successful we are in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, the impacts of a changing climate are already being observed. As resource managers, we need to anticipate those changes and work towards developing successful uh, adaptation strategies. I'd first like to highlight some of the factors which are driving the, the need for adaptation, then look at some of the work being undertaken to assess impacts and our, our vulnerability and then finish up with some thoughts on adaptation measures. In its fifth assessment report, the International Panel on Climate Change concluded with very high confidence that there will be an increase in the frequency and severity of climate stresses related to heavy precipitation and declining snowpack cover. It further suggests that we will need to find or develop better procedures to anticipate and deal with these effects. Next slide. So what are we seeing? The flooding in Calgary and Toronto in 2013 really captured our attention. Public Safety Canada, which has a mandate to mitigate losses from natural disasters, reports that federal disaster assistance payments have escalated from approximately $10 million per year in the period between 1975 and 1995 to 280 million in 2012-2013. Next slide. Likewise, the Insurance Bureau of Canada reports that insurable losses due to water damage, particularly related to Alberta and Toronto floods, is escalating as well. And flooding has now become the largest insurable loss in Canada. Next slide. Dr. Flair, Blair Feltney, who is chair of the Climate Change Adaptation Project, recommends four key items that we should be considering to improve our flood resiliency. Number one, update floodplain mapping. Number two, recognize the important role which natural infrastructure, such as wetlands and forests, can have in flood management. And four, to adapt our building codes uh, to be more resilient to extreme events. Next slide. Public Safety Canada released the National Floodplain Management Framework last year which looked at best practices for floodplain management in Canada and internationally, essentially to develop new standards for flood risk identification. The framework recommends establishing a minimum national flood standard of 1 in 350 years as compared to the 1 in 100 year standard that currently is, is used across Eastern Ontario. I think Jim had mentioned the, the 1 in 100 year uh, event that we typically look at in terms of flood risk. More recently, the federal government has also announced a $200 million program over five years to support the, or aimed at improving the identification of flood hazards and to establish conditions for a residential flood insurance market in Canada. Next slide. This is a, basically a chart that shows the uh, Southern Ontario or, or Ontario with flood standards 
zones. Zone two, which is eastern Ontario, is the one in 100 year flood standard. And zone one, which is more of the southwestern part of uh, the province, they typically use the maximum of hurricane hazel or design storm associated with hurricane ha hazel or the one in 100 year. <coughs> and in zone three, it's, it's the maximum of either the Timmins storm or the one in 100 year. So the recommendation is to consider a higher uh, event standard. The reason for that is if you look at the, the probability of actually achieving a 1 in 100 year uh, flood uh, in a 100 year period is actually 65%. So it's very likely that you will see uh, that, that uh, flood occur within that time period. And in fact, on the Mississippi, uh, we've had a couple of occasions where we've actually exceeded that. Next slide. So in response, in 2012, the City of Ottawa and the three local conservation authorities initiated a four-year program to update and produce new flood risk mapping within the city. Much of the previous mapping was completed under the Federal Flood Damage Reduction Program back in the 1970s and 1980s, so it was in excess of 30 years of age and really didn't reflect the amount of growth and development that occurred over that time frame. So this program is continuing um, and both the Rideau Valley and the South Nation River Conservation Authorities are working uh, to update these maps. Next slide. As well, natural infrastructure, recognizing the important function which our green space has in flood management is gaining increased attention. As suburban development continues, employing low impact development measures to enhance infiltration and maintain the natural water balance is proving to be a cost-effective solution to managing stormwater and limiting the impact on receiving streams. Now looking at a little different aspect, changes in watershed hydrology, up until now we've really focused on the impact of those extreme events uh, and the dramatic consequences, the consequences which tends to capture our attention. Changes in our climate can as well result in a far more subtle change which can also have serious consequences to our built infrastructure and communities. The IPCC fifth assessment report also projects reduced snow depth earlier in spring, earlier spring freshets, increased winter flows, and lower summer flows. And I'd like to use the Mississippi River as a case study to highlight what some of these changes may mean. Next slide. Now the, the, uh, the Mississippi River watershed is fairly typical of many watersheds in eastern Ontario which originate on the Canadian Shield. The drainage area is approximately 3,800 square kilometers in size and extends about 200 kilometers to its confluence with the Ottawa River. The area consists of 66% forest cover with about 14% of the total area covered by water. Historically, the river was used to drive logs to the Ottawa River and in the late 1800s, a series of control dams and reservoirs were constructed to augment flows to the textile mills in Charles Place and Almont. The reservoirs are in purple with the uh, Almont and Carlton Place located downstream. In the early 1900s, the Ameri uh, Ontario Hydroelectric Commission assumed management of these control dams to augment flows for hydropower sites along the river. Over the ensuing years, the storage reservoirs provided a source of stable water levels for recreation, tourism, and navigation, which attracted development along their shores. In 2007, the Mississippi River Water Management Plan was prepared to guide operation of the seven main storage reservoirs along the river. And the plan was developed to integrate the operation of all these structures uh, as a unit, uh, but it did not account for changes in climate. The next slide. On the Mississippi River, we're, we're fortunate to have a, a very lengthy stream flow record uh, at the lower end of the river. And this is a, a, just a graph of the maximum annual stream flows that have been recorded back to 1918 on the river. And as you can see, it's, there's a lot of variation in the, 
um, in the stream flows from year to year, but it's a relatively stable mean of about 150 cubic meters per second. And that's really what you would expect to see. The Mississippi River is typical of others, other rivers of its size in, the, in eastern Ontario, uh, in which the highest flows tend to occur from a combination of snow melt and rainfall in the spring. We look at the maximum summer flows, and this is sort of from June to uh, June to September time frame. The maximum flows uh, are typically in the summer are, are much less, except for 2002. That was the first year on record in 100 years almost that the maximum flow of the year occurred as a result, direct result of a uh, summer rainfall event. In fact, at Appleton, well, the flows were. Uh, about 150 cubic meters per second it was just sort of at the verge of, of causing damage. Farther upstream, we actually exceeded the 100 year. So it's, it's, uh, it is an issue that is, is becoming more uh, relevant. Next slide. Now, if we consider the average winter flow, and this is in the January, February time frame, we see some significant changes occurring, particularly since 1960. This raises a concern as river systems such as the Mississippi River should exhibit a stable mean unless there have been significant changes in either land use, impoundment, or climate. The Mississippi River over the past 100 years really hasn't changed in terms of land use or impoundment. The impoundment occurred uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, and the forest cover really hasn't changed, particularly in the upper upper reaches of the base, and so it really is primarily in terms of climate. And the reason for the, the higher flows in the winter are less snow, snow accumulation with a greater portion of the uh, precipitation occurring as rainfall over that time frame. So what does this mean for us who have to manage these reservoirs such as big? The red reservoir system is well suited to capture snow melt in the spring and release it at select periods to augment flows in the lower part of the, the river system over the, over the summer. And it, when they originally, originally developed this, this plan, uh, it's quite remarkable at, at the ingenuity in the upper five uh, reservoirs. Essentially, the, the red line is the stream flow and the blue line is the uh, reservoir level. So in the spring, the, uh, uh, the lakes are, are filled with the, with the spring runoff, uh, held relatively stable over the summer to, to maintain for uh, levels for recreation and navigation, and then drawn down in the fall. The lower reservoir, which is the main reservoir, uh, is drawn down over the summer to release flows downstream for flow augmentation. As the upper reservoirs are, are released, that water is stored in the main reservoir again, and then released over the winter period to again augment flows downstream. Next slide. A number of years ago, we completed uh, an analysis of projected climate uh, out to uh, over the next 90 years, up to 2100. The blue line is the uh, what we have recorded or, or projected uh, from 1974 through to 2002. And the succeeding periods uh, from 2010 to 2099 uh, uh, are projected there as well. And I'll show you what the so the implications are that we're projecting as the IPC is is uh, predicting as well that the lower spring freshets occurring earlier, uh, higher uh, flows in the fall and winter, and lower summer flows. Next slide. The implications here are the, the uh, future runoff conditions or the shift in, in, in uh, runoff distribution becomes incompatible with our current operating policy. So the real question now becomes one of how do we contend with that shift uh, without creating problems downstream. As you can see in the fall period when we're traditionally lowering the uh, or releasing water 
uh, getting ready for this for the for the winter and the next year's uh, spring freshet, our flow rates have increased substantially to the point that by releasing water, we're actually placing communities into flood uh, flood stage. The option then is to either not uh, lower the, the lakes, which results in the, uh, problems in terms of the, the ice cover on the lakes, or to not fill the lakes to the same, the same extent as we have in the past, which has, uh, results in uh, potential problems in terms of both recreation and, and water supply. Next slide. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so in summary, the uh, projected uh, runoff conditions, uh, looking into the future, uh, will create some, some difficulties for us. Uh, much high, more highly variable flows over the fall and winter with potential risks in terms of increased flood risk uh, in the winter, achieving summer target levels uh, because of changes in reservoir operations. Uh, potential water supply targets and shoreline damage with unsafe, unsafe ice, ice conditions on the on the reservoirs. So our challenge, the the uh, uh, we have challenges in front of us. I think we have to understand the implications of, of how these these flows are going to change and what we can do to uh, to mitigate those. Thank you.